Christ is risen. It doesn't take very long for the, the joy of Easter to start to fade, does it? I mean, even just a, a scant two weeks after we use that joyful greeting, it pretty quickly fades from memory or is a little bit muted in our, our, our saying it. I mean, I suppose you could say that that's, that's maybe not the best indicator of Easter joy and, and how long that Easter joy lasts, whether you can, can say he is risen in response to the greeting Christ is risen. However, I, I'd like you to think about your life these past two weeks. I'd like you to honestly think about that joy of the resurrection. Does, it, does that joy still fill your walk of daily life in faith? Has that joy of the empty tomb and, and Christ's resurrection, has that, has that silenced all of your fears and, and wiped away all of your tears these last two weeks? I mean, that is, after all, what we sing in the hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. Has that joy remained with you, or even though that extraordinary joy of the resurrection of Jesus is meant, you know, it's meant for ordinary life, as that extraordinary joy started to get a little bit lost in the humdrum of daily existence. As that joy that, that Christ is risen and that you have eternal life. As that started to fade against the backdrop of all of the sorrows and, and the problems that, that you struggle with in, in your daily existence. That joyful message of the resurrection and the joy that it brings is one that, that we need to be reminded of often because we, we often do lose sight of that joy. And so this morning, our Savior Jesus reminds us of the joy that no one will take away from them. In fact, our Savior doesn't just remind us, but in that Gospel lesson, he was actually trying to talk to his own disciples about that joy before his death and resurrection. Monday, Thursday, Jesus spoke to his disciples about this joy. He said to them, a little while and you will see me no longer, and again a little while and you will see me. Now that little while, it gave the disciples some difficulty, didn't it? They, they weren't quite sure what Jesus meant, that a little while and they wouldn't see him and they'd be sad, and then again a little while and they'd see him and they'd rejoice. They just didn't get what he was talking about. They weren't sure. In fact, they, they were trying to discuss it among themselves. They wanted to ask Jesus about it because they, they just were puzzled by this whole little while business. With the benefit of hindsight, you and I probably don't struggle with that little while as much as Jesus' disciples did. We hear Jesus say that a little while and his disciples would weep and mourn. And we think about the fact that Jesus said that on Monday, Thursday, and, and it's pretty obvious, well, he's talking about the fact that in less than 24 hours, he was going to be betrayed, arrested, he was going to suffer before Pontius Pilate, be crucified, die, and ultimately be placed in a tomb. In less than one day, those disciples would no longer see their Savior Jesus. He would be taken from them and hidden behind a massive stone. And that death of Jesus and his burial would certainly bring them some sorrow. They would have sorrow that their friend and their teacher had been taken from them. Of course, the world rejoiced at that death of Jesus. The Pharisees were happy that they no longer had to worry about this, this threat to their popularity, this threat to their power over the Jewish nation. Pilate undoubtedly breathed a sigh of relief after Jesus was in the tomb because that, that whole unpleasant business that had landed in his courtroom was now finished and had an end. For those disciples, though, that death of Jesus brought them sorrow. In fact, so much sorrow that they were overwhelmed by it. In fact, they were afraid. We only hear about one of Jesus' disciples actually coming to the site of the crucifixion. And it wasn't any of those disciples who buried Jesus and put him in the tomb. Nor were they the ones who went to that tomb to anoint his body for, for its permanent burial. Now, in fact, if you remember the gospel lesson from last week, those disciples kept themselves locked away in a room because they were so frightened and overwhelmed by sorrow at that death of Jesus and what it might mean for them. But a little while later, 
after that death of Jesus, and their sorrow turned to joy, right? No more than three days, and the Savior burst from his tomb, appeared to those disciples, and showed them all sorts of convincing proofs that he was alive. Those disciples got to see not only their, their friend and their teacher in the flesh, they got to see those, those nail marks in his hands and that place where the spear pierced his side. They were convinced that this truly was Jesus, risen from the dead. They rejoiced and were overjoyed, in fact, that they saw their Lord and their God. But the joy those disciples had at seeing Jesus again, it, it wasn't like the joy that you or I would have if we were reunited with someone that, that we didn't expect to see again. If it was something like we, we met up with a long-lost friend by accident. That's not the kind of joy those disciples had. At least that's not all the joy that they had. That resurrection of Jesus also brought them the joy that they now were guaranteed eternal life. Their joy was the joy of knowing that Christ's death on the cross was a victory, that their sins had been paid for, and that they had the hope of everlasting life. In fact, that joy was so great, it overwhelmed their sorrow. The, the illustration, the comparison Jesus used to talk about this joy really didn't ring true for those disciples. The Savior said to them, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her time has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. For a woman, that event of the birth of a child, it brings both sorrow and joy. There's, of course, the, the sorrow of the pain connected with labor and delivery. But there's the joy of that, that newborn infant. And if you've ever watched that process unfold or been through it yourself, you know the truth of what Jesus is talking about. I've watched my wife go through that. And every time there's been that, that pain of the labor and delivery, but you know, as soon as she gets that little child in her arms, it's, it's almost like somebody, somebody flipped a switch somewhere. And it's not like the pain didn't happen or that there isn't still some, some residual pain. But it's all lost and it's all forgotten. It's overwhelmed by the joy of that new little infant. And that's what it was for those disciples. The same event, Jesus' death, brought them sorrow, but it also brought them joy. There was the sorrow at being separated from their friend, and yet the overwhelming joy, knowing that that death had brought peace with God and eternal life. I know what a difference that that joy of the risen Jesus made for those disciples. In fact, if you want to see just, just how much that, that joy overwhelmed their sorrow, then sit down this week and read the first couple of chapters of the book of Acts. It wouldn't take you very long to, to work through about the first six to eight chapters. And if you do that this week, you'll see how those disciples, who were so overwhelmed by their fear and their sorrow at Jesus' death that they abandoned him in the Garden of Gethsemane, that they couldn't even show up at the cross, most of them. That fear that gripped them so that they locked the doors because they were afraid of what might happen to them. In those opening chapters of Acts, you see how those disciples, in the joy of the resurrection, couldn't help but tell people about that Savior Jesus who had given them eternal life. And in fact, they, they consistently told that message of Jesus even when they were threatened with prison and punishment and death itself. In fact, in those opening chapters of Acts, you not only get to see how much that joy of Easter overwhelmed those disciples and, and led them to share the news about Jesus with others, you see the impact that joy had on the first believers in the New Testament church as that church grew and spread an amazing thing, that joy of the resurrection. It's a joy that, that none of the problems of this life could take from those disciples. When you think about that joy, you think back on these words Jesus spoke to those disciples, it's also clear, isn't it? It's also obvious to us the joy that Jesus was already trying to talk to his disciples about and comfort them with, even before he went to the cross, and even before his resurrection. It's so clear and it's so obvious for us as we sit in church this morning, but the truth of the matter is, there are, there are those times in this life, there are those, those little whiles for our lives 
when we lose sight of Jesus. There are those, those little whiles where even though that joy cannot be taken from us by anyone, we maybe take our eyes off of that joy. It might be from the, the cold or the allergy that, that doesn't just make your physical eyes bleary, but makes your spiritual eyes bleary as, as all you see is frustration and annoyance at that health Perhaps instead of seeing that Savior Jesus, your conscience and heart are, are clouded over by all of your failures in this life and you no longer see that face of Jesus shining upon you with his mercy. It might be that at times you can only see the times you've messed up as a parent or a spouse or you've let down a friend and you'll see that Savior Jesus. Or instead of seeing Jesus, you see your, your anger or resentment towards a co-worker who betrayed you. Or instead of seeing that Savior who hung on the cross for your sins, you only see the crosses that you have to carry in this life. Or there are even those times when instead of seeing Jesus, you see the empty nothingness that's left when a loved one is called out of this life. Even though that joy of the resurrection cannot be taken away from you by anyone, there are those times when we do lose focus on that resurrection. And to our Savior Jesus, he does what he did with those disciples. He helps to bring our focus back to that joy that no one can take from us. Our Savior reminds you and me that what he said to those disciples is true for us as well. We have a joy that no one can take from us. I mean, you just think about all of those problems that, that I mentioned and all the other problems of this life that I didn't have time to mention. Is there a one of them that can take away the joy of eternal life? Think about it. Is there any illness that can rob you of the eternal life that is yours in Christ Jesus. Can cancer do it? Can a cold do it? Can the flu do it? Or what about any of the crosses in this life? No matter how big or how small, is there any cross that can take away the victory Christ won by his cross? Not a one, right? Or you think about your failures in this life. Your mistakes and, and your screw-ups. Is there a one of those that can nullify the forgiveness that Christ won on the cross and assured you with the empty tomb? Is there one failure that can take away his forgiveness? In fact, even if you pile up all of those sorrows of this life, even if you take all the crosses and all the illnesses and all the failures and you pile them all together into a big giant heap, and you compare that heap to the joy of the resurrection, it starts to look downright minuscule. Because there's nothing that can take away, or that can even change in the smallest bit, that joy of eternal life. It's a certainty. It's a fact. You see, that's the joy that Jesus gives. It's not a, an emotional feeling. It's not a, a sentimental memory. It is a certain reality. The reality that you have eternal life stored up for you. And nothing can take that away. In fact, believers in the past used to have a, a very unique way of reminding themselves of the fact that this joy of the resurrection could never be taken from them. It was a custom connected to death, actually. They would call the day that a believer died that believer's birthday. Think about that. The day a believer dies, their birthday. And why not do that, right? What a powerful reminder that, that not even death itself can rob a believer of any of the joys won for us in Christ Jesus, and that in fact, death itself is actually the entrance to that greatest celebration of all our joys, getting to see our Savior in heaven forever. That joy that our Savior won for us by his empty tomb, it makes all the difference, doesn't it? makes all the difference, not just for those disciples, it makes all the difference in our lives. Even though it's, maybe it would be a nice thing to look back at that book of Acts and see the joy of that resurrection overwhelm those disciples and reflect on their lives. That joy of the resurrection, it also overwhelms the sorrows in our lives. 
It's that joy of the resurrection that enables you to, to face the, the problems of this life. It's that joy of the resurrection that gives you the strength to carry the crosses that your Savior gives you. It's that joy of the resurrection that empowers you to forgive the failures of others that hurt you and to also cling to the forgiveness of your failures that Christ offers. It's that joy of the resurrection that silences every fear connected to any illness or any fear connected to death itself. And that's all true because no one, no one can take away that joy of the resurrection from you. No wonder we could sing at the beginning of our service, now let the heavens be joyful, now let earth her song begin. Let all the world keep triumphant and all that is therein. Let all things, seen and unseen, their notes of gladness blend. For Christ the Lord has risen. Our joy shall have no end. That truth stands firm. The joy you have in Christ is one that no one can take from you. Alleluia. Amen. Please stand. Peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. <laughs>